Hey, welcome to another episode of the All Cast. This is going to be uh, another episode of the uh, the Freedom Solo Cast, and today it's all about the Declaration of Independence. So I'm going to read through the Declaration of Independence as it is written, and uh, I'm going to give uh, some comments, some notes, maybe clarify some uh, different words that are words that we don't really use today or um, don't know the definitions to. The reason I'm doing this is. <laughs> There's going to be a a whole bunch of these um, from the book that I have here, The Constitution of the United States of America and Selected Writings of the Founding Fathers. And this book is crucial for today, all the years past, and all the years coming. Um, It has different things like Benjamin Franklin's um, Articles of Confederation. It has inaugural speeches from some of the first presidents. It has, obviously, the Declaration, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. uh, And it's it's extremely important. Something that's being sidestepped or lost or intentionally put aside uh, in today's legislation. But in reading through the Declaration of Independence a little bit ago today, I noticed that There's a lot of similarities happening right now in the United States of America that our founders were dealing with as far as oppression by the state of Great Britain back then. So it's it's still extremely applicable. Let's go ahead and read through it and uh, see what we can glean. The Declaration of Independence in Congress, July 4th, 1776. The Unanimous Declaration of the Thirteen United States of America. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So that's basically saying when it becomes necessary to express what's causing this separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That means that we the people establish something to help us govern ourselves and each other, but only when those who are being governed consent to it. Continuing, that when any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So basically, if the government is not serving you to the ends for which it was created, then it's our duty to abolish it and to create a new government that affects uh, our safety and our happiness. Continuing. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, It is their right, it is their duty to throw off that government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. All right, so let's take um, that 
pr- that phrase, the present king of Great Britain. And we remove that and uh, we fill in the blank with basically whoever's in control and whoever's in power that right now is a system gone too far. A system gone too far and it's producing tyranny. So listen to the next sections and think about maybe who <laughs> who these people are that are doing these things because the things that are that I'm about to read are happening. Continuing. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the repository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large. For their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of the land. So he's basically, he's, he's preventing immigration, period. He is uh, refusing to change the conditions based on new information. He has... Con- He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders for which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule in these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments." for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. So they're saying this guy, he is doing all these things and he is unfit to rule. So we're out of here. 
He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and their brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and our correspondences. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the World for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The foregoing declaration was, by order of Congress, engrossed and signed by the following members. John Hancock, Josiah Bartlett, William Whipple, Matthew Thornton, Caesar Rodney, George Reed, Thomas McKean, Samuel Adams, Samuel Chase, John Adams, William Paca, Robert Treat Payne, Thomas Stone, Elbridge Jerry, Charles Carroll, Stephen Hopkins, George Wythe, William Ellery, Richard Henry Lee, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Harrison, Thomas Nelson Jr., Roger Sherman, Samuel Huntington, Francis Lightfoot Lee, William Williams, Carter Braxton, Oliver Wolcott, William Floyd, William Hooper, Philip Livingston, Joseph Hughes, Francis Lewis, John Penn, Lewis Morris, Edward Rutledge, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, Thomas Hayward Jr., Thomas Lynch Jr., Francis Hopkinson, Arthur Middleton, John Hart, Abraham Clark, Button Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, George Walton, Robert Morris, Benjamin Rush, Benjamin Franklin, John Morton, John Klein, George Clymer, James Smith, George Taylor, James Wilson, and George Ross. There we have it. The Declaration of Independence of the United Colonies of America. Much of this still applies today um, in principle. Unfortunately, some of it doesn't still apply in action. 55 men. 55 men endorse this. These people were representatives from different states. We have representatives from New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Delaware, Maryland, Rhode Island, Virginia, Connecticut, Georgia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, South Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina, and New York. Now, why do I, why am I reading this? Why should I read this? 
well, first of all, I wanted to read it as a reminder to myself what's going on now compared to what was happening then. They're very similar. And what did they do back then? They wrote, hey, we're not going to be a part of you anymore, and here's why. And as we establish our own government, this is the safeguard that we have within the establishing of our own government. If it becomes too large, like Great Britain has, and too tyrannical, and starts serving itself rather than the will of the people, people's happiness and people's safety, then it's our duty to abolish it and put in a new government. Well, that's happening right now. What, what's it going to take? What do we do? I don't have the answers. I'm here reading this right now to be reminded of what it says and how it's said and to share it with anybody listening so that we can start to get a better idea as a unified people of how to take care of ourselves, whether it's on the county level, the state level, even the federal level. Federal nowadays just seems too big to manage. It's too many people. You can't have one president for all these people. It just doesn't work. But in the name of safety, they pass laws that take away our right to protect ourselves. I'm sure I'd be called a, an insurrectionist or, or a terrorist or something when really I'm a patriot. Reading straight from the founding documents themselves, these are what our founders said, this, is what, this was their intention, this is what they wanted, and this is what we patriots are attempting to adhere to. So how do we do that without bloodshed, without violence? I don't know. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Thomas Jefferson said, The tree of liberty from time to time must be watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants. I don't want it to come to that. I don't want it to be bloody. I don't want it to be ugly. I don't want to have to risk losing family, friends, Americans, anybody. I don't want people to die in order for us to regain and retain the freedom that people once died for. They paid that price long ago. Do we have to pay it again? Well, it's starting to look like it, and that troubles me deeply. However, <clears throat> there's a few things I want to point out um, that, that are in this Declaration of Independence that are often overlooked uh, because they're about God. Now, it's not very specific as to whether or not it's Christian, God, or Protestant, whatever. Uh, but it says three different times it makes references to God. And this Declaration of Independence was founded on God. Now, I don't care what religion or belief or spirituality or whatever your system is, we are all on the same playing field. We're all human beings on earth doing, doing the same type of stuff. So whatever your belief systems, we're all on common ground. So if we were made by God, which I believe we were, all made by the same God. So when it says here, it refers to it as nature's God. It also refers to divine providence. It also refers to the supreme judge of the world. And supreme judge, uh, the S and the J, are capitalized in this writing. So that's giving a title to it, just as in the Bible, uh, he, him, Jesus, God, uh, those are all capitalized in reference to the divine. But what it says here... Um, we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in General Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. And later on it goes to say, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So if we are divided as a nation, then it's not going to work. 
we have to we have to stand up to all of these things that are trying to divide us the race the gender the sexual orientation the all this crap that's being intentionally injected into our culture to cause division let's go to the pledge of allegiance for example i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america to the republic for which it stands that we're, we're, we're we're talking about the republic that the flag stands for, which is the we the people with a firm reliance on divine providence and nature's God, appealing to the supreme judge of the world. That's what it's in reference to. One nation under God, indivisible. That means unable to be divided with liberty and justice for all. That's for everybody. That doesn't mean it's all going to look the same, but it's available to all of us as long as we agree on an individual level and a collective level to uphold it. But as soon as we allow ourselves to become victims of race-mongering or, or sexual orientation division or... Uh, all this stuff, like I said before, that's being injected intentionally into our culture to divide it. As soon as we submit ourselves to that division, we fail. We fail. So we have to uphold our own individual constitution. We have to humble ourselves before God. We have to agree that all men and women are created equal. That means that we have equal value. We are equally as valuable in the eyes of God. And we have to look through that lens at each other to recognize our inherent value for just being alive. Many of the patriots I know that served, that still serve, that have sacrificed so much to fight for this country. You always hear that, fight for this country, fight for freedom. This is the freedom we're talking about. We're fighting for the individuals to be seen through the lens of God's eyes as having equal value, as, be, as just being human beings alive. A few minutes ago, I mentioned that the price for this freedom was already paid. And now there are people that are trying to take it away from us. And those of us who want the freedom are bigger and more than those people trying to take it away. So we need to act, and we need to not give in to division. A few minutes ago, I said something about how the price has already been paid. And are we going to have to pay for it again? Well, it certainly looks that way. But I want to talk about another price. As I mentioned, being equal in God's eyes and us looking through that lens to see each other as of equal value for just being human beings alive on earth. And the way that God sees us is beautiful. And that price was already paid. Not everybody believes that, but that's okay. You don't have to. You don't have to work for it. It's just a gift. It was already done. It's already been given. The price has already been paid, not only for our freedoms here in this country, but for our soul. And the only thing that has to happen from it is that you accept it, that you receive the gift. It's really that simple. You know who I'm talking about.